Mr. Gandhi will be happy to take questions from you, and thanks for the interesting presentation. But may I first invite Ms. Venita, Associate Professor of the SASB, to moderate the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gandhi. Uh, also, thank you very much for keeping the time that gives us plenty of uh, opportunities to engage you. So may I invite comments and questions, uh, and can I please request that you identify yourself and keep your questions and comments brief so many more can participate in this discussion. Questions, please. Are there microphones? Two microphones on two sides of the room. Yes, please. Hello, my name is uh, Tang Lee. I'm known as a social political blogger. I've watched the movie Gandhi uh, more than one occasion, and I'm an I am an admirer of uh, the Mahatma. Mike, I've got two, two interesting questions, or two questions that have always interested me. The simple one is, do you believe that India would be one country rather than India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh today had the Mahatma? achieved what he wanted to achieve, that's one. My second question becomes a little bit more complicated, but do you feel that his methods might have been different if the situation uh, that he faced was different? And what I mean by that is, he was in a situation during independence, and it's, there's a quote in the movie of where there was a case of 100,000 Englishmen were ruling 300 million Indians. And he just, as he says, 100,000 Englishmen cannot rule 300 million Indians if the 300 million Indians refuse to be ruled. Now, do you think he would have had to do something different had the Indians been in a, the minority? And the example I have, the comparison that comes to mind is the case of Tibet, where Dalai Lama has been an admirer of Mahatma Gandhi and regards the Mahatma as his idol. He's been insisted that there's a non-violence in the Tibetan independence movement, and yet the Tibetans continue to be a minor minority who are widely and openly oppressed in their own country. Would he have done the same thing if India was in that position? Thank you, sir. Well, uh, I think what answers your question is his first movement for equal rights in South Africa. In South Africa, the Indians were in a minority as compared to others. Although the majority of people were completely disenfranchised, but the Indians were still in a minority even as compared to the colonials over there. And so the fact that being in a minority or a majority didn't matter as long as they were on the right side. You know, he always believed in the bat uh, right against might, the battle of right against might. And he always waged that as his main strategy. If you look at the Salt March, uh, the message that he sent out to the world on the eve of the salt, uh, of picking up the salt at Gandhi was, I want world sympathy in this battle of right against might. And it became very difficult for the colonial power to uh, face worldwide criticism. If you look at the uh, history of world politics post the Salt uh, March, you will see that the British found it very difficult to justify their continuing colonial rule in India or anywhere for that matter after that. And so the, I don't think uh, numbers would have mattered to him. It was his, his strong belief in that uh, thing. The problem that Tibet faces is the Dalai Lama has become a very iconic figure and celebrities like to identify with him. But in the face of uh, Chinese foreign policies, even the President of the United States has to make a convoluted excuse to come face to face with the visiting Dalai Lama. Even South Africa refuses him a visa to visit uh, South Africa and that is the problem. The world has not honestly identified with the cause of the Tibetans. 
they venerate the Dalai Lama as the icon and the living uh, uh, image of the aspirations of the Tibetan people. But the world, in a very selfish manner, has refused to make the cause of the Tibetans their own. And as long as that doesn't happen, I don't think the if efforts of a single person will make a difference. Bapu was able to convince the world of the correctness of his actions and make them sympathize with uh, that. The recent spate of uh, self-immolations also have really not created the kind of opinion that should have been created by now against, if anything, nothing else, the human tragedy that is occurring there. And you see a lot of lip sympathy being paid, but when push comes to shove, the Chinese uh, 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 needs and they are much more uh, accommodated than the Tibetan demands are worldwide. And that is the difference, I feel, between the movement of the Indian independence and what is happening uh, in Tibet or what was uh, also happening in uh, Burma. Uh, as far as your uh, question about uh, uh, Bapu and the question of partition goes, I, uh, you asked me whether it would have been different had he succeeded, I, I, keeping us together? Yes, we, we only have one country called India rather than uh, like one country. Well, I think what happened was, if it was left to Bapu, he would never have allowed for the vivisection of the country, at least not with the British in power. He kept saying when he realized that there were internal forces in action that were difficult to control, the final solution that he had offered was that the British should declare India independence and walk away, and then let Indians decide whether they wanted to live together or have uh, the country divided into a Muslim homeland and, in, uh, and an Indian. There was no question of a Hindu homeland in any case, but uh, whatever remained behind. And the fact remains that it was never a Muslim homeland because we had more Muslims living back in India than those who went over to Pakistan or what is now Bangladesh. And so, uh, that also failed in its uh, belief or in its objective of creating a, a, a complete division of religions. And Bapu knew that this division, you know, and that I think what I studied of the history, I believe that there was a lot of naivety in the leadership of that time. They were all carving out their personal political faiths. They wanted their political domains to be safeguarded and they were creating that and they didn't realize that it would be a separation of human beings also. They felt that you know they would carve out their own provinces and rule over them and everything else would remain the same. You know. People would remain where they were and they wouldn't make any difference. Bapu had sensed the personal tragedy that would occur. He had sensed that if Pakistan had to survive, it could not survive with a large Hindu population living inside of that Pakistan. And so there had to be a movement. And if there was a movement from one side, there would be a reciprocating movement from the other also. And that was the human tragedy. If you look at Jawaharlal Nehru or any of the other Congress leaders who accepted, who were the first people to accept the partition, after two years, they all lamented the fact that had we known the human tragedy that was to follow, we would never have accepted this. But when there was a solution provided by Bapu, they refused to listen to it. They were too keen to get the fruits of power and enjoy them. And so it didn't matter the price that they had to end up paying. Of course, Looking at what has happened in the subcontinent, uh, maybe it was a blessing in disguise. Yes, please. May I carry this uh, Tibet question forward? You have said that the world has not genuinely sympathized with the Tibetan cause. That may be one reason. The other reason is 
that Bapu, while fighting for Indian, in, in, Indian independence, was facing a power which was uh, cunning, clever, uh, ruthless, uh, but at the same time law-abiding. Yes. In, in many ways, it, it followed a certain uh, legal structure at home and, and outside. Uh, the Tibetans are facing problems, or uh, put it generally that it depends upon the question of non-violence in this kind of a struggle. It uh, depends on uh, what is the nature of the power you're dealing with. That whether the power opposite you is willing to negotiate and talk and follow rules and regulations, there is one kind of a dynamics which would evolve. But the, the power against you uh, does not believe in any of these things. Or is very easy to get back to much harsher methods. Uh, so Tiananmen Square was one example. You don't really get through, and therefore others have to adjust either, or they, they, they do something else. So it's not only on the global sympathies for the Tibetans, but also on the nature of confrontation which is being uh, posed to these people. That is, uh, I agree with that, but I also believe that for a non-violent movement to succeed, it must have honest worldwide support, or at least a majority support, so that pressure is built on the other party to also uh, do in today's world with the economic sanctions and things. If, if the world really believed in the Tibetan cause, then uh, I feel that there, were, there are many ways to deal with that situation. But I don't see the honest will in doing that. Everybody looks at their personal benefits also before thinking of the but I agree with you that uh, the reciprocal uh, belief is also very important and how your adversary will react to it is also very important. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Gandhi, for an extremely uh, scintillating uh, uh, presentation. My point is, uh, as you know, I'm from Bangladesh, and uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi is held in very great respect in Bangladesh. And I explained to you that uh, during our watch, uh, your uncle, Governor Gandhi, had come to Bangladesh, and we organized for him to visit Noakali, which was the scene of riots in Bangladesh. But the question of whether there should have been one India or three Indias, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and all that, is a huge political question. Mm -hmm. And you know we have very different opinions of that, so uh, I'd rather not go into that at this point in time. Like this discussion, which is uh, focused on non-violence, one of the things I mu we must understand, and this is uh, uh, this is a uh, comment, that the nature of violence as we perceive it today, today's uh, uh, political value system, has altered greatly. I mean, violence is no longer physical. I mean, you uh, society is violent if it denies women. Rights. Society is violent when it denies <coughs> civic rights or the rights of the Palestinian to return home. So the nature, the connotation of violence has changed greatly, and we sort of have to calibrate our response to that kind of thing. Absolutely, and uh, I think the time has come when the UN has declared 2nd October to be the International Day of Nonviolence. I think the time has come when there should be a system of auditing nations on the uh, their adherence to nonviolence and you know bringing out the ranking of nation on their practices of nonviolence. There is there is a peace ranking. There is an, uh, an organization from Australia which ranks nations on their peace index. And I believe uh, Iceland is number one at the moment on the peace index. India is 135th. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I think it, there is time that uh, academics should come together to form a yardstick by which the adherence to the belief of nonviolence on these various things, gender equality, human rights, uh, the, their uh, uh, system of corporal punishment and everything should be tabulated in an index of the nation or a rank for that nation on nonviolence should be uh, brought out. I think we need to do many more programs to make people aware of how much inherent violence they have 
and they breed within themselves, uh, even without aggression and strife. And uh, that will sensitize people to the forms of violence that have crept into our everyday life. I have been thinking of this idea, and maybe with Papu's uh, blessings, one of these days we will come up with a formula or a scale to measure nations on their nonviolence practices. I'm Dr. Vipi Nahai, as president of the yes. And of course, we are responsible for you, know, you being here. I appreciated your talk on all the three seminars, including today. <coughs> but when we talk in terms of, say, religious tolerance or, or uh, national tolerance, there's a difference between tolerance and acceptance. You know, when you say, I tolerate you, well, you're not so good, but I don't mind tolerating you. I think the concept of acceptance is not there in the world. And that's what's happening in Tibet, Burma, India, Bangladesh, or for that matter, anywhere in the world. What is your comment on that? Well, I, I believe that a person believing in nonviolence cannot have this attitude of tolerance at all, because tolerance is finite. It's a physics term, uh, you know, uh, and it's finite. Uh, any, anything beyond its, uh, its, its labeled capacity to tolerate will make it explode. And when that explosion occurs, it creates a, a, a very destructive, uh, leaves behind a very destructive result. So I, know, I for one believe that uh, there is no room for tolerance. There should be understanding and an ability to respect differences. Because where there are going to be two people, there are going to be differences. And we must respect each other's differences and learn to live with that. You know, when I got married, everybody told me it's not going to be Anki Dori. She's going to be different, I'm going to be different. But we'll have to learn to love despite of our differences. And I think even in uh, humanity, that is equally important, that we respect each other's uh, differences. We respect each other's right to have different practices. And then we learn to accept that and uh, live our lives. If we do that, it will be much better than a society which only prides itself on its tolerance. Because the tolerance, as I said, is a finite quantity. And it ends in tragedy almost every time. Surya from Aisas. Well, this is a hypothetical question, but a fascinating one, I believe. <coughs> one of the many, many what ifs. Do you think Mahatma Gandhi would have wanted India to become a nuclear weapon state? Well, Bapu, in, uh, after uh, Hiroshima, Bapu said that uh, humanity had now uh, unleashed it, uh, you know, or sown the seeds of its own destruction. So, Bapu would never want India to become. Power, but you must also understand today's India is not Bapu's India. In no ways can it be uh, termed as being Bapu's India. We've moved very far away from the India that Bapu had in his dreams. If it was a, if it had been the India of Bapu's dreams, we would not have lived with such disparities in our society. Disparities that are now threatening to tear us apart. I am not here to talk about uh, the Indian situation at all. I would love to talk about it, but I have disciplined myself not to talk about it when uh, this occasion doesn't ask for it. But yes, uh, the nuclear power India is uh, the creation of Bapu's worst nightmare. I have two questions. Uh, one is that uh, I'm sure you agree that uh, Gandhi has been constantly reinvented, reimagined. And Gandhi is a historical personality, flesh and blood. But there are also imaginary Gandhis. Would you agree that in a contemporary context in various parts of the world, it's actually the imaginary Gandhi which actually survives? And, and actually, the imaginary Gandhi actually provides a lot of inspirational values to 
all kinds of people who are fighting against the tyrannies of all kinds. That's the first question. I would think imaginary Gandhi has become more powerful than historic Gandhi, if you want to make that distinction. Second, uh, many years ago, in my own university in Delhi, uh, students invited me to speak on the 2nd October. And I always reflected on how Gandhi disconcerts. Gandhi makes us feel uncomfortable. And I was trying to locate the degree of discomfort while I'm a student of politics. That how Gandhi, of course, would talk about transformation of heart. It's a transformation of politics which is not very compatible with modern idiom of politics that we are familiar with today. And that actually made a lot of us very uncomfortable. But before we start critiquing state, before we start critiquing institutions, Gandhi would say that, look, look at yourself. Are you changing? Are you doing something things? Are you responsible? And a lot of us were not really ready for that. We wanted to criticize. We are citizens. We have rights. And then we were trying to figure it out what, how really Gandhi, sometimes the modern politics of Gandhi, sometimes can be at opposite end. And, and the effort, therefore, is to create a balance between institutional politics of transformation <coughs> and the transformation that actually resides in us. They're talking about, you began by talking about heart. Does modern politics recognize heart? Apart from, you know, the heart as contributing to identity politics or politics of affect, as you call it. Apart from that, any meaningful sense that the heart is reconcilable to the modern idiom of politics. I wanted your comments. Tough question, but I'll try to answer them. Uh, the first one is very simple, you know, the icon is always very romantic because you create that icon in your own imagination and so there are a lot of rom romantic, uh, I'm sure many of the people who uh, canonize Baku will see an imaginary cape on him also and you know, uh, uh, give him superhuman qualities and uh, things and it's bec it becomes easier to, uh, to, to, to uh, get inspired by that because the heroism of the person is then magnified and you can, you know, in, the, in your worst situation you can still have a glimmer of hope that, uh, you know, suddenly Superman will appear. So the iconic romanticized icon is always going to be much more influential and uh, that's where the the uh, race is to build and erect statues of Baku rather than institutions that would work uh, to promote uh, his ideology and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, leave behind living uh, examples of his ideology uh, forever. So that I agree with you that it is, uh, the romantic image is much more powerful than the, the reality is because if you look at Babu in reality is so so simple, so unglamorous, so so uh, he didn't even have a grand way of speaking, and so there's law, very less that could uh, uh, romantically charm you from that man. But it's his belief, it's it's, it's his transparency that uh, has given him the longevity. There. Ever since this anti-corruption movement has started in India, I have always been a critic of the way it has been conducted because it has turned all Indians into finger pointers. You know, you stand up and you criticize all the political class, you criticize all the official class and say everyone is corrupt, everyone takes bribes. But the, the, the critical factor of holding up a mirror to the society and showing the society how much they had become components of that corruption was missed. Bapu would have started off with that. He would have said, yeah, are you, you are frustrated with corruption. You feel corruption is hindering you. Here is the example of how you are feeding the monster of corruption yourself. Corruption, I believe, very strongly is a two-way street. It is not a one-way want. It's a two-way want which feeds on each other. 
And like the famous saying in the Tiger Protection Program, that when the buying stops, the killing will stop too. In corruption too, when the giving stops, the taking will stop too. Maybe the components are a bit more skewed in corruption. But there is a component of giving that encourages and feeds the monster of corruption as much as there is a component of greed <coughs> that takes uh, feeds that corruption. And Bapu would have introspected and asked his people to introspect before accusing. Over here what happened was platforms were provided and uh, you were told to come and you know, abuse anybody and everybody you liked or disliked. And so that is where the Gandhian aspect of the whole movement was tarnished and corrupted in that movement. And that is where I believe that it did not even last long because the battle for corruption cannot be a six month battle. It, it has to be an ongoing process of reform. Only then it can become. Corruption is not a disease that has to be cured. It is an addiction that has to be reformed. And so the, the, that concept has to be understood by people. Just before coming here, we were watching a debate on uh, national television in, in uh, Singapore today they were, they were discussing whether Asia is chronically corrupt or can Asian nations become corruption free. And I don't think anybody is chronically corrupt. The fact is that everybody wants to be have an easy life and corruption is the best way to get that for oneself and that is the attitude that needs to be changed and brought uh, down both sides, both sides of the coin. As far, as far as politics having a heart or a soul, I think today politics has more of a bank balance and no, 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 no heart or soul <laughs> left to it and that is where the politics of principles is a chimera, you know, it, it's a mirage that everybody likes to show and talk about, but nobody has an example of it in living history, at, at least in our part of the world. We have time for one more question. Yes. We don't mind. In, in a simple form, the attitude problem here, when you, when you look at the superiority contest and the inferiority contest, with the best, and the question you find in, in the aura of, for example, supremacy dimension, and then India is one of them, and of which you see in America, and you see now the white supremacy seems to be tough destruction because of poor political, economic policies and so on. How do you read what's going on and what you see the trends going to be tomorrow? In India? Worldwide. Well, I think in some way or the other, humanity is addicted to hierarchies. Some places like India, we have our caste hierarchies. Other places, we have economic uh, and academic hierarchies too. And uh, though they are very stratified and isolated in themselves, America may be seeing a uh, 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 reduction in uh, the white supremacist uh, apparent face. But uh, look at both the campaigns of Obama. And if you look at the opposition's campaign, there's a very thin veneer of sophistication in it. The hostility of race is very apparent below the surface. The, references, the snide references to the color of his skin and his so-called religion is very, very, it may be subtle, they may not make it very uh, loudly and uh, clearly, but the intentions are there to uh, shoot him down on those two uh, aspects more than the performance of his first term. And so I don't believe that those prejudices are on the way. I believe they're just there below the surface at the moment. The liberals are more apparent and so the liberal ideology is more uh, worldwide. But all over the world, those kind of 
uh, uh, subtle uh, uh, layers or currents are uh, still Europe is seeing a fledgling uh, uh, su supremacist movement or, uh, or uh, racial movement gaining hand where European nations are facing a lot of immigration from their former colonies. I was in Holland and uh, uh, while flying to Holland from I think, uh, yes, from India, I had a Dutch businessman sitting next to me. And uh, he kept saying he was a liberal, but he kept blaming all the crime and all the uh, ailments in Holland on the Middle Eastern immigrants that were flooding his poor little Holland. He said, we built dikes against the sea, but we can't build dikes against the heathens. And that is the attitude uh, that all of them have. So the undercurrents of uh, racial prejudice and religious prejudice are still as uh, apparent in uh, society. And I think uh, we have uh, the battle of uh, love and understanding and equality has to be waged equally uh, in a fanatical manner as the fanaticism of uh, divisions. Are there any final questions or comments? Uh, can I follow up on that? Now, you noted that the new transformation, you looked at the, the confrontation in the South China Sea. Well, incidentally, ASEAN did not come along with a solution 40 years ago, we call it ASEANIC Ocean. So we don't have an ASEANIC Ocean. So uh, interestingly, you have the South China Sea and the, South, uh, the, the East China Sea. The question between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So when I talk about it 40 years ago, I say we need to have, uh, before the incorporation of the you know 40 years of battling to get the ASEAN agenda, it takes 40 years to reach somewhere there. And even after you got it, you just don't appreciate it. So what your grandfather did in the context of this the, the, the doctrine, it just there to be on the wall on books and whatever, not. But it's not in practice. So the question is that we see new things coming up in Singapore context between the, the Chinese, the Mandarin Chinese versus the Nanyang Chinese. The, the division seems to be wider and wider and wider. The government trying to contain and contain and conceal and conceal and conceal. So the question is that, how does you overcome such tendency and, and the inclination of trying to, you know, make it as though it doesn't doesn't really exist? Well, that's the problem I think that uh, we've always faced in trying to brush uncomfortable situations under the carpet till they explode in one space. Uh, you were left with a. Uh, knee-jerk reaction to it. And I, I believe if uh, one, the world has to go the way of Gandhi, or of Buddha, or, or, or uh, Mahavira, or even uh, Jesus, or Muhammad, uh, for that matter, uh, it has to be a long-term patient uh, belief and a practice. It can't be, uh, as I said, non-violence is not uh, instant medicine uh, to cure a headache. It is a way of life that ensures that you never have a headache that becomes unbearable. On that note, uh, let me close this session formally and please join me in thanking Mr. Gandhi. Thank you, Mr. Gandhi. Thank you, Vinita.